This is Vern Venom Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. One morning recently in San Francisco, a man on the street bolster asked passing pedestrians this question, does love make you live longer? And all of those who answered were older men and women. A retired postal employee said absolutely not. I'm going on 84, and I attribute my long life, and a very happy one, I might add, to the fact that I never got involved with the ladies. I've never been in love. I don't know what all the fuss over love is all about. It's nothing but a lot of trouble. The further away you keep from love and marriage, he said, the better off you'll be. A retired shipyard worker said, I sincerely believe love does help you live longer. Being in love, your life is much happier. You're not lonely. Oh, they say true love never runs smoothly, and that's true, but then it's pretty good when you make up, he said. So many people are lonely, it's very tragic. They die of a broken heart. A retired coffee foreman answered the question, does love make you live longer, by saying, I believe it does. It sure can make your life happier, I know that. I'm 77, and I've been in love twice, he said. But then he somewhat reconsidered and said, in a way, love probably doesn't make any difference at all in how long you live. You might be just as well off having a good doctor. A grandmother of four said, love makes you live happier. A retired steel mill worker said, love can make you live longer, but then it can shorten your life, too. Depends entirely on the woman. Some women, well, you'd be better off with a short life. He said, I married a fine woman. I think if I hadn't been in love, and if it weren't for her, I'd have left the planet long ago. A retired lamp manufacturer said, love is an art which is not inborn. You have to learn to develop the beautiful senses that love can give. And another retired man said, no, love has never done a thing for me. But consider, why are most of humankind so preoccupied with love in one way or another? Why is it there are more definitions of love than of any other word in the English language? Why is it that some people will live for love, some will die for it, almost everybody yearns for it, but almost nobody knows what it is? Nobody's ever seen love, love itself, and yet it remains the most powerful motivating force of humankind, love. 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth summarized his entire religious teaching in two commandments, which have been described as the laws of love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love, he proclaimed, is what life is all about. There's an old story about a man who married a woman as a business proposition, but he did everything a loving husband should do and found, to his surprise, that he had come to fall in love with his wife. Have you ever heard the true story of Mrs. Isidore Strauss? She was one of the few women who went down on the ship Titanic in the year 1912, and she went down because she could not bear to leave her husband. Both he and she were calm throughout the excitement of loading the lifeboats. Both aided frightened women and children to find places aboard them. Finally, Mr. Strauss, who had been urging his wife again and again to seek safety in a lifeboat, forced her to enter one. She was no more seated, however, than she sprang up and got to the deck before her husband could stop her. And there she caught his arm, snuggling it against her side, and saying... We have been long together through a great many years. We are old now. Where you go, I will go. And I have a very good idea where they went. However you may think of heaven, it is a place for those who have learned to love. For to live in love of God and live in love of humankind is the fulfillment of Jesus' two great commandments. The story is told one day in Scotland. A great eagle swooped down from the sky and carried away an infant, which was sleeping close by its mother's cottage. The whole village then ran after it. The eagle soon placed the baby high up on a cliff near its nest. Everyone despaired of the child's being recovered. A strong sailor attempted to climb the cliff, but his limbs began to tremble, and at last he had to give up the attempt. A shepherd, accustomed to climbing the hills, tried next, but he gave way and fell to the bottom of the cliff. At last, though, a poor peasant woman appeared. She put her feet on the one shelf of rock, then on the other, then on a third... The hearts of those who were looking on trembled with fear for her. Slowly she rose, higher and higher, until at last she reached the very top of the cliff. She took the baby in her arms and then, step by step, began the dangerous descent. She moved slowly, carefully. After a while, she stood at the bottom of the cliff with the child safe in her arms. Why did this peasant woman succeed when the strong sailor and the experienced shepherd had failed? It was because of the strong tie of love which bound her to the baby, for she was the baby's mother. 
And so it is with the love of God for you. It is parental. It is powerful. Because God is an infinitely loving Father, the Father of all of humankind who calls us to live in love, in concord, and in peace. William Ellery Channing has written, War will never yield but to the principles of universal justice and of love, and these have no sure root but in the religion of Jesus. Said Einstein, Peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. Thomas Jefferson wrote in one of his letters, You have not been mistaken in supposing my views and feelings to be in favor of the abolition of war. I hope it is practicable by improving the mind and morals of society to lessen this disposition to war wrote the poet Edmund Sears, for lo, the days are hastening on by prophet bards foretold, when with the ever-circling years comes round the age of gold, when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors fling, and the whole world send back the song which now the angels sing. And the great poet Wordsworth wrote, God for his service needeth not proud work of human skill, they please him best who labor most in peace to do his will. There lies the heart of the matter. For the peace which passes all understanding is the peace of heart and soul to be found in complete commitment to the will of God. Giving your life to God is a beautiful, all-encompassing experience. It is a total, all-engulfing experience. Unfortunately, the way I'm discussing it, giving your life to God also sounds like being swallowed by a whale, perhaps. Human language is simply insufficient to portray the joy of wholehearted, worshipful dedication to the will of God. Then in quiet times, as well as turbulent ones, you can know God's love for you. It is personal. It is enduring. We may choose to know our Father better through simple conversation, through prayer. God is always with us, ready to comfort and guide, to counsel and to share the peace and certainty the energy and enthusiasm that will come from our partnership with God's perfection, from trying to know God and seeking to do God's will are the greatest sources of hope and of joy we human beings can ever have and the greatest vehicle for change of this world imaginable. And may the light and love of the infinite Father of all things and all beings be with you as you live your daily life. You can claim it by faith. Remember you're a child of God, a member of in God's worldwide family. As we grow, we children on this planet, we will learn to cooperate with one another, to like and to love each other better and more genuinely. Each and every day we live, these truths that God is the father of each of us, we're all his children, one family, are the most practical yet life-changing information we can share with our brothers and sisters, and we can know ourselves. Let the knowledge that God is your father, that God does love you infinitely and immeasurably, Fill your life with joy and with spiritual energy. You're God's child. You're a member of his family. And our human family under our divine father will grow stronger and stronger as more and more people come to know God and share the joy of this great brotherhood. Therefore, love God and worship God. Now you may ask, well, why does God need my love? Does he need me to love him? Is God going to die if I don't love him? Certainly not. By the same reasoning, why do you pay your water bill every month? Is it because the water company needs you or because you need it? The water company is not going to go bankrupt if you stop using water and paying your bill. And neither is God going to wither up and evaporate if you reject his love and refuse to love him in return. The first and most immediately understandable reason for loving God is not because he needs it, but because we need it, because you need it. Loving God is the highest fulfillment of your human nature as a son or daughter of God. Certainly, God mightily craves for our love. God longs for a more free and open sense of spiritual companionship with you. But nevertheless, the decision rests entirely upon your shoulders. God has done everything already, which God can possibly do. The choice from this point on is yours. The choice to believe in that love, to claim that love of God by intense internal faith and then begin to live in that love as a fully conscious son or daughter of the first source and center of all. 
I was reading in the biography of an internationally famous singer, and in it came across her favorite prayer. It isn't long, only one sentence. Let me read it to you. Dear God, treat me tomorrow as I have treated others today. I can only say, thank heaven that God does not do that. We would all have some miserably bad days. God is infinitely loving. Jesus did not say, do to others as they have done to us, but rather to do to others as we would have them do to us. There is a vast difference. So neither does God treat us only as we have treated him, or we all would have a torturous time of it at times. Instead, God treats us with loving mercy, as a father cares for his family, for all are sons and daughters of God around the very perimeter of this great planet. And by becoming part of the dawning spiritual renaissance, you are personally going to have your part in the changing of this world. Do you want to know how to change the world? Don't spend all your time praying for God to change the world. Just take a piece of chalk and draw a circle on the floor, then step inside that circle and say, God, I'm not asking you to change the entire world to transform the planet, but I am asking you to change everything inside this chalk circle. And if you mean it, he will. And that will be the beginning of your part in making this world different. You cannot conceivably kindle the fires of renewal upon this planet unless they first are burning within your soul. But the God of this universe has a plan for this planet and a will for the living of your life and eternal life beyond it if you will dare thus to give your life to God in love, in dedication, in wholehearted commitment and saying, here am I, use me, here am I, send me. Said Jesus, blessed are you when you hear the word of God and obey it and do it. He said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Make your commitment to God and pray those words of the Lord's Prayer, your will be done with utter sincerity, and God will transform you, and through you, you will be part of the transformation of this world. And then write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, all this literature yours with no cost, charge, or obligation. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.